Turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 14. We're going to be beginning this morning in verse 15, but by way of remembrance or bringing us into the place that the Holy Spirit would have us, we begin in 14.1 because Jesus is in the last night of his life. They're in the upper room and they're getting ready to go out. We will get to that point, I promise you. I know I stated it last week. The last verse of this chapter, they go out of the upper room. But they're in the upper room, and lots of stuff is going on in their hearts. But Jesus is going to the cross, and yet he's comforting them. He's the one that's getting ready to die, and yet he's comforting them. I think of it the same way with the rest of the apostles. When you begin to look at, we were in... Um, Colossians on Friday night and Paul is in prison and yet he's thinking of others listen it doesn't matter your situation what's going on in your life what matters is where your heart is focused listen things are going to happen in life good bad and indifferent there's going to be suffering and pain and death but where is your heart focused what are you looking at who are you trusting in where is your hope what truth are you following? Who is leading you through this life is the important part that is going to be there that you should always remember that God loves you. And no matter what's going on, he's going to get you to the other side. So as he tells them the truth of everything that's going on, and I'm not going to rehearse it again in chapter 13, then as he says to them, let not your heart be troubled. Don't be agitated by this. Don't be drug around by this. Don't let your heart move away from the plumb line because of these things. You believe in God, believe also in me, he would say there in 14.1. Very important to understand that no matter what's going on, that Jesus is still the Messiah. Jesus has still come to save. There's salvation in no other name. And then he gives them the promise. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. And he's going to go prepare a place. And if he's going to go prepare a place, he's going to come again to receive us unto him. That where he is, we may be also. Isn't that what this is all about? Being into a new family, coming back into the family of God? Listen, we're born following the spirit of this world. We're born dead. We're born none righteous, no, not one. And there's an antichrist spirit leading us away, leading us to self and sin and Satan. But God wants to give us his spirit. He wants to bring us back to his house. He wants to restore us. That's what salvation, redemption, deliverance from the sin nature is all about. Yet the people who call themselves the church... They come to God and they say a prayer and they continue following the spirit of Antichrist. Instead of letting his spirit lead them, Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the children of God. Now, what are they doing in the upper room? They're having a meal. This is being instituted. He's telling them what's going on. Peter, you're going to deny me three times before morning. But what do they do? No matter what, they follow him. Watch, they're going to go through this and they're going to follow him. He's giving them some instructions. They're going to follow him from the table where he's going. And until he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, they don't do anything but follow him. But then they scatter. And he already told them, I'm telling you this so that when it happens, you will believe me. That's why it's so important to be in the Word of God, in prayer, in fellowship, to be that close to God where you're hearing what He's saying and then it happens and you already know that the waters are still, no matter what the storm looks like, that it's still calm. It's still in my position, is my place, and, and, and my person is fine because He's coming to get me. I'm going to get to the other side. My hope is not in what I'm doing except where my heart is being placed. Am I drawing near to God? Am I drawing near to God in a way where I will hear his voice and learn and grow and keep following what the Holy Spirit is doing? 
not get caught up and follow the spirit of this world again, which is the old nature, the old voice, the one that brought death. We want to learn to hear the voice of God. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. But there's a lot of other voices and they're all from the spirit of Antichrist that are crying and vying for your attention. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 14.6. And no one comes back into the family, into the Father, except by me, Jesus says. There's no way to get back to the Father. There's no way to get the spirit of truth. There's no way to receive salvation except through Jesus. Salvation in no other name. Listen to me. These are basic, basic rudimentary things that we need to know these are the elementary principles of the gospel and yet the church is still living in the spirit of antichrist the church that, that, that those that call the church i call it apostasy we are still chasing everything that the spirit of this world wants us to chase and we think we're okay and we are in grave trouble at the heart of our christian walk and that should alarm all of us Listen, you might be doing fine. And you say, well, it don't alarm me because I know what I'm doing. I'm being led by the Spirit. Listen, it should alarm you for your loved ones. It should alarm you for the people that are around you. It should alarm you because of the souls that God died to save. And we are called to go and be witnesses to them. And it should alarm you that so many people think they're okay. And they're falling fast with holes in their parachute. And they can't withstand. They can't withstand this. That's why we're seeing churches that, that are emptying out, with every new catastrophe and every new fear and every new lie. Churches empty out. Oh, that's a huge reversal since 9/11. Just since 9/11, the manufactured lie. 9/11, the church is filled up for all of two weeks. And when we seen there was a big war and nothing else happening, everybody left again call it foxhole Christianity we only run to God when things are bad foxhole Christianity we jump down in the foxhole and we go help Lord help Lord never mind Lord I got this this is not a heart that's drawing near to God learning to trust God learning to wait upon God learning to be like Christ now, we, the, the, the reason I say these things, the reason we talk about these things, is because we need to sound the alarm and wake ourselves up. And Christ will give us light. Then we can learn to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. There's no new commands for us. If we're being led out of this battlefield, not a, not, a, not, a, not, a, not a playground, a battleground. If we're being led out by the Spirit of God, we need to wake up and hear His voice. Or we'll be led out and into another battle where there's no hope. So he goes on to tell us, and if you remember with me, because it's, to me, the number one thing we need to do is pray. And if you pray, then the Holy Spirit's going to tell you to get into the Word of God, and the Word of God's going to tell you not to forsake assembling together. So you're going to be in the Word, Prayer, and Fellowship. But in 14.14, in 14, he tells us, if you ask, if you pray, anything in my name, I will do it. Now listen to me. That's a, that's a huge promise. But it's qualified by name, character, nature, and will. It's qualified also by a conditional statement. If, because we're getting ready to move to another one in 15. If, these ifs are conditional statements. It's a choice of yours that you have to make. It, it, it's not that, that if you do this, it's there. It's No, no, no. You make the choice. It's conditional upon what you're choosing to do. If you pray and you align your heart and your life with the will of God, with the name of God, with the authority of God, to do the work of God that, that is saving souls, and we ask in his name, I guarantee you he'll do it. I guarantee it. Because he's already doing it. 
And praying is us aligning our hearts with God and what he's already doing. Becoming dependent upon him and learning to trust him and seeing what he's doing in the spiritual realm. So the word if here uh, is often connected with other particles that denote an indefiniteness or uncertainty. See, it's not God that's uncertain. It's our decision. It's our decision about whether we're certain. His actions, everything that he's ever done proves that he loves us. Proves who he is. He tells us the end before the beginning. Everything that God's doing is certain. It's written. It's finished. The question is, is about you and me. If we will pray. If we will ask according to his nature, his character, his will, his authority, his name. If we will believe that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one can come to the Father except through him. If we love him, we'll keep his commandments. Let's, let's, let's read 14, 15. If you love me, Jesus, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you a little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to clearly see and hear what you're saying to the church today. Thank you for your spirit. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now again, these last couple statements here I like um, qualified with if. And these are conditional in case of and they're provided what you know the, the word if is, is the the in case and then the case is provided if you ask that's the case if you love that's the case love what me if you excuse me if you love me keep my commandments becomes the evidence these are choices of where we turn our hearts toward of what spirit we want to follow God's already done everything. It's a finished deal. Listen, everything about salvation is finished, completed. Everything. He's already died for all the sins of the world. Now we're standing in the courtroom and we're deciding whether we're going to believe the truth or not. If you choose to pray and ask in his name, if is the case here, provided you love me, keep my commandments. Now listen, listen, you're going, oh my goodness. Now we're working our way into salvation? No. No, see, here's the whole point. If you really look at it, I have no ability to keep God's commandments. And Jesus is saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now you could think about where he just said in 13, he told them he washed their feet and he says, it, uh, it, uh, it, uh, a new commandment I give to you. Remember that? Love one another as I have loved you. Is that all he's talking about? Or is he talking about washing feet and taking care of one another? Or is he talking about all of his word? Is he wanting us to know who he is and what he's doing in his commandments? Listen to me. This is very important. Commandments means an authoritative prescription. Yes, it means precepts. Yes, it means orders. Yes, it means rules. Yes, it means. But it's an authoritative prescription for life, for a sick soul. And, and if you want your soul to be healed, washed and cleansed, and become like Christ, pure, undefiled, and holy, the same place that we already positionally are, you have to obey his word. 
You, we all have to, but we're, our souls are rebellious. We want to believe something that's much easier. Well, I already said a prayer, Greg. Aren't, am I not fine? Listen to me. If you say a prayer and you ask Jesus to come into your heart and you say you believe in Jesus, the very first thing Jesus is asking you to do is to repent. That's the first word of the gospel. That's the first word. If you, you, you let not your heart be troubled. You believe in me, believe also in God. Or you believe in God, believe also in me. The very first thing Jesus wants you to do is believe that you have to change your mind. See, we were lost. We were under the spirit of Antichrist. We were walking. We did not even know that there, we were in trouble. We did not know that salvation existed. And he knocked on our door and woke us up by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now if you believe in him and trust him for your spiritual salvation, for your, for your spiritual truth, you entrust him to be led out of this world, you have to change your mind because your mind was set on sin and self and Satan. And now we have to set our mind on the things of the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, to be taught by the Spirit, to understand that everything that we did before was underneath the lie, the spirit of lies, the father of lies. It was a different spirit. But if we continue to do everything with the same instructor, the same teacher, the same lies, the same world, chasing the same thing, we haven't repented at all. We haven't changed our mind at all. We're only deceiving ourselves. This is, this is James says, become doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And self-deception is difficult, people. When I think I'm okay, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to do anything because I'm all right. You're okay. I'm okay. Everybody's okay. And yet we have a false system being set up all around us, getting worse and worse every day, more deceptive every day, less information. We have, we have information traveling everywhere, but it's all being guided by the Antichrist because they're shutting down truth. They don't want truth to get out. And where do we get our information? We Google it. Who's controlling the Google? Antichrist. Oh, God is allowing it. He's not out of control. He's allowing hearts to go Google everything that they want, to go listen to the spirit of Antichrist, to continue following and be delusional in everything that you've ever done. Well, haven't you read, Greg, if you Google it, there's 180 articles that come up that all say the same thing. Uh-huh, they all lie. There's only one truth, it's Jesus. If you're following his spirit, you'll see that they're lying. Very simple. When somebody controls everything, see, we're down here in their house. God allowed them to have this place down here. It's a graveyard full of dead men walking. They mock us. They make movies called The Walking Dead. They mock us. They make movies about every bit of it. And what do we do? I'm a Christian, but I'm going to be entertained by this stuff. And it's mocking us in our face. And we're entertained by it instead of shocked by it and saying, you know what? This is really what's going on in the spiritual realm. And if I would be listening, I'd be warning people about these lies that they're trying to continue to solidify. Just like your name. It's, it's, it's something that happens in life. If you hear something long enough, you believe it. Whether it's a lie or truth. You know your name. You've heard it all your life. You think people are saying it when they're not saying it. And you turn around and go, who called for me? You know, because you know that to be truth. That's your name. So everything else that you continue to put in through the spirit of Antichrist begins to train you to believe that. Or you can listen to the truth. The way, the truth, and the life. And now we need to have evidence. He's given us the conditional evidence of everything. If you ask, I'll do it. Conditional. It's up to you. Do I want to pray? Do I really believe what the Bible's telling me? That the world is underneath the sway of the wicked one. That the world is underneath a different spirit. That the world is lying to me. On every corner there's a demon. Do you really believe that? Greg's lost his mind. There's no demons on the corners. Listen. There's a spirit of Antichrist out there wanting you to have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. 
It's wanting you to be religious, but deny the God who actually created religion. It wants you to follow the synagogues of Satan and think you're okay and be self-deceived and keep right on doing what you've always done. And that's not changing your mind at all. That's not believing God at all. That's continuing to believe that you're God. It's continuing to believe that you are the master of your destiny. Stupid sayings that we've made up in all of these little synagogues of Satan that people still, it drives me crazy when I hear Christians talking about these things from other religions and they have no idea that it's even a religion. They're practicing them. They're doing them. They're following them. I'm not being mean. I'm not being critical. I'm not being self-righteous. I'm saying we have to wake up and spend time with our Lord in intimacy and find out what the truth is so we stop following the lie. We've seen the whole nation of Israel do this in the Old Testament. And God laments, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. When everything's done, everything's laid open, everything is freely given, everything is provided for us, and all we have to do is come and spend time, gnoskos, knowledge with him, in intimacy. And he will teach us. Draw near to God. You have to, as James says, submit to God. James 4, 7. Submit to God to choice. If you submit to God, surrender. Here I am, Lord. I'm asking help. This is crazy. I'm in this crazy, vast graveyard, and I don't understand. I don't know how to get out. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm tired of pretending. I'm asking, Lord, show me your will. Listen, that's a prayer. That's also changing your mind. Because in our pride, we act like, oh, I'm fine. I'm good. It's also changing your mind, saying, I don't know. And admitting that you need to find the lighthouse. You need to find the plumb line. You need to meet Jesus personally. And if you ask, he'll come. Make no mistake, that part of the altar caller is real. But then, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Where are we at with that? See, because I'm just telling you, I have no ability to do that. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, and in, in truth, as I ask and I say I have no ability to do that, see, because my nature will always reject God, rebel against God, live against God. If I leave it up to my truth and my ways, there's a way that seems right in my heart, which leads to death. I will go right back to doing the same thing, eating the same vomit, chasing the same pig, pig piles, but when the prodigal son come to his senses, what did he do? He went the other way. He went back home. Here we're being offered a dwelling place, a new house with the Father. It's clearly said there's no way to get back to the Father except through me. That's what the dwelling place is about. That's why he adds it in there. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one's getting to the Father and back into his house except through me. So now are you asking? Or are you believing some lying spirit? Are you believing somebody that's telling you? Because see, when you get to the throne room, it's going to be about you and God alone. What did you do with my son? What did you do with my truth? Well, my husband told me your husband was wrong. Well, my wife told me your wife was wrong. My pastor told me your pastor was wrong. Listen, it's a personal relationship you need to come boldly to the throne of grace and you can't get to the throne of grace boldly until you believe in Jesus till you trust Jesus till you change your mind till you repent yes I am preaching to a room full of people who say they believe we need to know now and here is a plumb line once again if you love me love is agapeo it is a verb. Listen to me. It's a verb. It's an action word. All the action that ever needed to be done has been done by God. We cannot. We don't need to question his love. He laid down his life for us. 
He's getting ready to go do that, and they're more concerned about what is going on in their life than his. He's the one in the room getting ready to die. And all they're concerned about is self. Think about it. You've got this teacher you've been looking for all your life, and you go, wow. He's getting ready to go die. Why are you getting ready to go die for? We ain't going to let you die. Well, you're missing the whole point there because you need to die. I'm not going to die. I'm not going to let my family die. They need to die. To self. What do we do? We begin to have little homes and little houses and we build everybody up in their own esteem. We build everybody up in the world. We build everybody up in, in an indoctrination station. We teach them all to hate God by loving themselves. And God says, listen, if you want to be in my house, if you love me, you need to obey me. There's the if. There's the consideration. There's the rub meeting the road. If you love me, keep my commandments. My authoritative prescription. It's the only way to get out of here. If you love me, grab the rope. If you want to go, open the door. I'm knocking. The message doesn't change. You find it all through the scriptures. The same thing. We have to do it his way or it's self-deception. If you love me, personal, you, you, agape o me. It's in a social, moral sense. It's a verb. It's an action word. Which spirit are you listening to today? Now listen, listen. I got, I got to get, I got to get back to this. I want to make sure that you're not freaking out. We have no ability, but we can turn our hearts toward home. We can come to our senses. We can be awake. What happens when you're awake? Then Christ gives you light. What happens when he gives you light? Then you begin to make choices to see then that you walk circumspectly as exactly as you can. I need to be doing this and following this, obeying this, not continuing to live as a fool following the spirit of Antichrist, but walk as wise in wisdom, following Christ in the spirit. And then what do I do? I redeem the time. Making the most of the time. Buying back the time. The same way he bought back me. I want to make up for lost time. I don't need, you got to be careful with that one too because some people get it all the way twisted. Now I got to do everything. I don't have to sleep. I can just keep running and running and running. That's not what it's talking about. But it's talking about stop wasting all your time on the amusement park. Stop wasting all your time on feeding self and sin and Satan. Stop wasting all your time on the things that the Antichrist wants you to pursue and begin to spend your time learning what God wants you to do. His authoritative prescription. We've been following something that was a lie. Now what's his authoritative prescription? Well, it's in Jesus' name. That's the authority. It's according to Jesus' person. He's the plumb line. He says, follow me. Here in a minute, he's going to say, I will come to you. So clearly, when he sends the Spirit back to us, it's him coming to us because he, he's 100% God, 100% man. The Spirit's 100% God, 100% Spirit. It's, it's, they're all three 100% God. We already covered this in the last lesson. The Trinity is sometimes hard to understand but it's 100% God in three different persons that present themselves to us. The question is, are you looking to guard to watch, to keep his commands? That's what the word means. To, to keep means to guard, to watch, to protect. It's... it's, it's <coughs> It's to guard from loss or injury. <coughs> Figuratively, listen, it means to keep unmarried, to remain a chaste virgin. You see, because we're presented back to Christ as pure and holy. In the spiritual realm, positionally, we're chaste virgins. That's never slept with anybody because of the blood of Jesus. So now in the spiritual realm, our only intimacy is preparing for the wedding supper of the Lamb. We've been presented back as new creations, reborn, completely new, never spiritually slept with any lying false spirit of Antichrist. 
But yet we have to remain by learning what his commands are, learning where the light is leading us, learning how we're supposed to live. We stay unmarried from the world, from the spirit that keeps calling us back home. That's one of the big things that most people don't understand right now. The Catholic Church, the mothership, is trying to bring everybody back from the Protestant Reformation. Trying to bring everybody back. It's one of the big things that's going on. That's why you see all the actors on the main Christian music, uh, movies, they're all Catholic. It brings us all back in a convergence under one world religion. That we're all following the same God anyway. No, we're not. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. They don't continue to chase Antichrist's spirit. They, they, they don't do that. It's just that simple. They don't follow the hireling. They don't hear the voice of somebody else and go running and go, give me, a, give me another bowl of that. But they're looking to keep the word of God, to preserve the word of God, to hand it to other people, to hand out truth so that it strikes the conscience of other people. And then they agree, they get born again, they receive the spirit, the seed of God planted in them, and then they begin to grow. How do they grow? By obeying and keeping the commands. Well, how do you do that? You turn your heart toward home, and then God does all the work. God does all the work. We, we can't be faithful. It's a fruit of the Spirit. We can't wash and cleanse ourselves. It's what the Spirit does when you just surrender and turn your heart. When you submit, therefore, to God and resist the devil, Antichrist Spirit, then you draw near to God and he draws near to you. And then he tells you to begin to, to cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Well, I can't. I have no way. That's what I like to do. But when I'm obeying his commands, I'm cleansing my hands. I'm washing my hands in the water by the word. Listen to me. But when I keep doing everything I've always done and I have no heart to turn home, I'm okay. I said a prayer. Then I'm just being self-deceived. And we can all do that. We can all run back to the broken cisterns of this world and wash our hands in that and think we're okay because it feels good. It's a lonely place to be following Jesus. If you love me, that's the question, conditional. Guard my commandments. Stay unmarried from the world and others because you're already betrothed to me. Prepare yourself. Notice it's my commandments. Notice it's, well, let's, let's, go, let's back up real quick. Um, first usage of keep or watch is Matthew 19, 17. I want to go there, so let's go to Matthew 19, 17. And it's really the first usage... Um, It's really the first usage, and I think it's very important to understand what's going on because you have a man that's living under the law and thinks in his own self-deception that he's been doing good and keeping the law. And he's deceived. He's self-deceived. Listen, it's Matthew 19, 16. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good things shall I do? Notice the eyes. Make sure you notice the eyes. Because there's nothing you and I can do except trust that Jesus already took care of the curse. That Jesus already fulfilled the, the commandments for us and he gives it to us. That I may have eternal life. Notice his concern is, is I want eternal life. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. John 17, 3. We'll get there eventually. This is eternal life. Or there's eternal death, that they may know the Antichrist spirit and keep following it. There's only two spirits, there's only two houses, there's only two places, and there's only one name above all names, and there's only one spirit that's leading us out. All the rest of it is leading us back in, or deceiving us. But this, this man is curious enough to come to Jesus and ask how he can receive eternal life. 17, so he said to him, this is what the voice of God, the word of God, this is what God would say as he sent his son to the earth. 
Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. Is that the word proton? One. I think it might be. You guys can look that up later. That is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Guard the commandments. That's where it's used that first time. This is what Jesus is telling somebody that thinks that they've got everything going on. Guard the commandments. Guard my authoritative prescription for life. Guard it. Stay with it. Follow it. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you in it. Proclaim it. Be a witness of it. Guard it. Keep it. If you want to enter into life. What are you saying? He's in death right now? Yes. But if you want to enter into real life, and that more abundantly, guard the commandments. Guard his word. His authoritative prescription is his word. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. He said to him, which ones? Because we're talking about the Ten Commandments. Listen. Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I don't know if you know what he did, but he gave him the second tablet of the law. The first tablet to have uh, no other God before him. The first tablet's all about vertical relationship with God. He just called him good. So maybe he knows the vertical. I don't know. But the only thing he asked him about was how is he treating other people? The second tablet, your horizontal relationships. And he says, these I have done. The young man said, verse 20, all these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? So he knew something was still missing. He knew something was still missing. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard this, heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Listen, you got one TV, Sure, I'll sell it. You got three TVs? Well, wait a minute now. Great possessions. But really what was going on is that the possessions had him. The possessions had his heart. His works had his heart, not God. And you can't serve God and mammon. You're going to worship one and hate the other. You're going to love one and hate the other. What has your heart? What are, you, what are you worshiping? What's your master passion? If you're reading with us in Job, Job loses everything. Boom, 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 boom. His wife says, curse God and die. He, he says, I'm going to worship the Lord. He fell on his face and worshiped the Lord. That's what he did. He fell on, the face, on his face and worshiped the Lord. Do you need your stuff to worship the Lord? No. No. You need a heart turned toward God. You need to draw near to God. You need to submit to God and resist the devil. The stuff is all there to deceive you into worshiping it. This young man goes away sorrowful because he doesn't want to get rid of his stuff. His entire identity, his heart is wrapped up in his stuff. Now, many people will tell you, well, this doesn't mean everybody. Listen, what's your heart wrapped up in? That's what it means. What are you worshiping? What are you bowing down to? What's your master passion in life? Because Jesus says, if you love me, guard my commandments, keep my commandments, learn them, allow the Holy Spirit to teach you them, and then ask the Holy Spirit for power to obey them and to order your life right. And some is going to bear 30, fruit 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. We grow differently, but are we turning our hearts toward home? Or is our heart still troubled, agitated by the spirit of this world? Yeah, but we can be, and I, you know, I was talking to a young man this week, and I was sharing with him and talking about just a minor thing. And, you know, literally, literally, the mindset of the church, because he was raised in the church, 
he said, yeah, but I've always been taught that that was Christianity, and this is my other life, and this is my work life, and this is my this life. And he has his whole mind that he's supposed to compartmentalize everything instead of give his whole heart, soul, mind, and strength to God at once. And he's literally been not raised by his parents, but because he wasn't taught right, he's grown up thinking that that's this and that's that. That's my business life. That's my work life. That's my play life. This is my Christian life. No, you only have one life or one death. That's all you have. Either you're going to live according to the spirit of this age and the whole world's going to need to sway the wicked one, or you're going to listen to the spirit of God and learn to obey his authoritative prescription to lead us out of this world and into a new family, into a new dwelling place, eternal in the heavens. That's how we come to our senses. Like, nothing down here is good for me. Anything down here is bad. I'm just telling you, it's trash. It's evil. It's our need to sway the wicked one. It's been tainted by the devil. So our eyes are supposed to be fixed on heavenly things. Our citizenship is in heaven. Everything that we're doing is in the spiritual realm, no longer in the physical. That's difficult. It takes time. It's going to take the rest of your life to get this right. But we have to draw near, turn our hearts toward home. The most important thing is drawing near to God. Because the devil wants to separate you from God. To keep you separated from God. How did he do it? They were in the garden walking with him every single day. And they knew no other voice. And yet they still were drawn away from God by a lie. Do we think that we are better than that? No, we're not. I said a prayer. Well, it's a lie if you're not looking to turn toward home. It's a deception if you're not moving in the other direction. It's very difficult because we're all going to stumble, but sin has been paid for. So then the devil wants us to get our eyes on our sin. Then we get our eyes and we start arguing about power. No, God got all power. If you're really in his family and you really don't want your heart to be troubled, you really believe that he saved you, why are you worried about sin and power? He dealt with that. What we have to deal with is the practice. Listen, and the pleasure we have in our sin. That's our choice. That's the if. If you love me, stop doing that. Begin to learn to follow this and be led by the Spirit of God, doing the work of God for the glory of God. That's the sanctification. That's the washing and cleansing. Because God will let you stay in your sin. Why? Because he knows you're going to eventually cry out and go, Lord, you saved me. Why am I in this? And then you're asking in his name now. And he's going to do it. When you get to that place of desperation. He's not going to force you to get out of your sin. But all the power of the universe is there because it's already been dealt with. To walk away from it. And to begin to follow him in the light. And walk circumspectly. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. And today is the day for salvation. Today is the day to do it. And what you do it, do quickly. Don't do what Judas did and walk out of the upper room to go out after sin and self and Satan. And then there's the, this worldly remorse because he got caught. What are you worshiping today? What are you guarding? Listen, think about that for a minute. What are you guarding? Because if you're not guarding God's word, then you're guarding something else. If you're not watching God's word, then you're watching something else. So you can't keep your eye on. I was laughing about it because my brain is this crazy brain. And, and, and I even wrote it in my notes here because my brain is crazy. Um, what is a watch for? To tell time. And the days are few. We're supposed to be redeeming them. They're evil. See, that's my brain. I switch words like that. It's a watch. Because we only have so much time. And then it's going to be too late to guard and to watch and to keep and to tell others about his word. That's what we're called for. That's the only reason we're here. We're sounding the alarm. We're ringing the bell. We're saying, turn, repent. That's what we're doing. Wait a minute, are we? 
that's where we're back to, metanoia. We're back to that. Did we really turn? Did we really believe? Or did we just say a prayer? Because if we're still watching and keeping and guarding our treasures of this life, like the rich young ruler that went away sorrowful, it's going to be awful dark when we leave the upper room. Just like with Judas. That's why I said I might just do one verse. <laughs> I don't know. But it's a good verse. It's a plumb line. It's a it's 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 a it's a tiny verse, which means everything now. And see, and it's also conditional. See, because if you turn your heart toward home and you actually believe and you actually say, I've come to my senses, I'm the prodigal son, I'm the one that now wants to learn about this love and this action and this doing and his commandments and his prescription for life, then he says, I'll do something. If we actually turn, he says he'll do something. What does he say he'll do? I'll pray the Father. Look at it. It's verse 16. If you... leaving out some stuff that I really wanted to cover, but we'll keep moving. Instead of following me, we'll follow the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and if you study the Bible and you read the Bible, take note that there's some I wills, and those are good I wills because they're from Jesus. But if you're following yourself and you see that you reach young ruler, I will, I will, I, 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 those are bad eyes because you're looking in the wrong place. But if you look at Jesus' eyes, then you're following. See, my brain just does that. I'm sorry, guys. If you're looking at Jesus' eyes, you're following in the spiritual realm, and you're obeying his commands, and you're following the right things. But if you're looking with your eyes, you're going to be loving the things of this world. So we have to get out of the physical and into the spiritual so that we're not deceived. So he says, and if you love me, guard my commandments. In other words, take the pill. The prescription. See, it's not a mistake that the world is trying to feed us pills. It's not a mistake that the doctors are trying, and I'm not even picking on doctors. It's not the doctors. It's the system behind. It's the spirit behind that everything is about them. Well, why is that? Because they're feeling a need in the market that everybody's scared to death to die. It's a natural spirit because we're all afraid. We don't know what's going on. But Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus said, if you're agitated, you don't have to be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I got you another dwelling place. This body's made to wear out. But the world says, we're right here to take care of your physical needs. And if you don't want to follow the word of God and the prescription of God, then we've got a prescription for you you can follow over here and you'll feel good about yourself. We'll numb you and you won't even care anymore. But believe me, on judgment day, you're going to be concerned. Whether you're physical or spiritual is going to be very important then. What you're looking at and worshiping now is going to dictate where you go then. It is very difficult. It's an easy sentence to quote, be in the world but not of the world. Oh, yeah, that's a real good platitude. That's a real good word there, Greg. But it's very difficult to be in the world behind the enemy lines and not just join with them and do what they're doing. And then think about this. because I, I'll just go on a tangent on you. Then think about this. Then you have some little kids, some little offspring. And you're wanting to teach them about God, but all the rest of the world that they're involved with is doing some other stuff. And then they start yanking on your apron strings. They start yanking on your belt loop and going, come on, let's go do what they're doing. Come on, they're getting to go do that. Let's go do that. So then you have this other, these little children that have no idea about truth that we're supposed to be training. We're supposed to be teaching. We're supposed to be pointing. We're little, we're big gods to them because we're keeping them safe. But we let them drag us back into the muck and the mire because of peer pressure, 
because of the spirit of this world, because of what other people are doing. But the very thing that God calls us to do is to come out from among them. And then they say, well, why isn't your kid playing? Why isn't your kid doing? Why isn't you? Why didn't you didn't see that movie? Really? Why? And what a perfect opportunity in this grand courtroom to give witness to who your God is and what you're worshiping. And no matter what they say, they still hear truth. No matter what they do next, they still hear truth. And you're still faithful to do what you were doing because you're trying to keep his commandments. Make no mistake, too, you can also start trying to keep in guard and become religion if you leave the Holy Spirit out because there's a way to answer people. That's why our scripture last week was uh, Colossians 4, 5. Walk with wisdom toward those who are outside redeeming the time. You want to know how to answer each one. Season that speech with salt. But it is speech. That's verse 6. Your speech is how you walk with wisdom. How do they know you're wise? Well, I don't know. You can go to Proverbs and it says, If a man keeps his mouth shut, he's considered wise. Then he opens his mouth and he relieves all doubt. Listen to me. But it is speech. Each one of us, when we talk, we're revealing something about where our heart is at and who we're worshiping and which prescription we're taking. And it saddens me that you open your mouth with the scriptures and the room clears out like that you turn on a light with some cockroaches. And we're all supposed to be the church. It saddens me. I'm not trying to say some haughty statement. But we, I mean, I, I mess up all the time. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. Got me an out now, don't I? Listen. Look what, look what Jesus will do. He's telling those he loves. They're the only ones in the upper room. The only betrayer that's lost has already left. They're only a family right now in the physical, but he's talking about what's going on in the spiritual. He waited to isolate. He waited to separate. This is the believer's meeting. Not inviting every unbeliever on the planet to come in and get in the way and cause destruction in the middle of the body of Christ. But believers sit down and get into the Word of God. Believers discuss the Word of God. Believers are being equipped and being witnesses. And Jesus is now telling them something that he would not tell Judas. He waited till he left so he could have this Bible study. Because the world can't see him. He's getting ready to talk about it. The world don't know him. He's not trying to reveal himself to the world. He's called us to witness to them. And if they believe our witness, then they become the family of God. Then they can hear his voice. Yet we sit around and talk about the world all the time instead of sit around and talk about Jesus and his commandments. We sit around and talk about what the LGBTQ is doing. We sit around and talk about what the warmongers are doing instead of talking about Jesus. We sit around and talk about physical instead of dwell on the spiritual and learn what the prescription is so we can go talk about it in the battlefield out there. And I digress. So 16, if we will... If we love him, he's going to love us. He already loves us. He died for us. Think about that for a minute. But he says, I will pray the Father. So now he's going to ask the Father. Because all of this comes from the Father. Listen to me. He, get, he, he never, ever does anything unless he sees the Father doing it. He is obeying the Father's commandments. He is perfectly obeying and becoming our example as he does it. Even he's going to say down here, where is it, 24 maybe? No, 20. Well, my brain went dead. He says it's not his word. Oh, it's in 20, uh, 24. Yeah, it was 24, just like I said. He who does not love me does not keep my words. He says it again. He's going to say it three times. Uh, this one's in the diminutive where he gets it from the backside. The word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Listen, 
What he's telling you is he's obeying the Father's command. That's how he's lifted to the highest authority that there is, because he obeyed. And now we, if we love, he's showing his love for the Father because he's perfectly obeying the Father in the house. Now you and I, we show our love by learning to obey. How do we do that, Greg? We listen to him and we follow his example. And then if we do that, he's going to pray the Father and send us a helper to do this with. And it's actually him, the spirit of truth. He's going to ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Isn't that cool? He will give you. He doesn't say he might. He'll think about it. He is matter of fact. He knows what the word of God is. He knows what the Father is because he is the word of God. And he's relaying exactly what the Father said about life. He's relaying. He becomes the living word. What the Father has said about his house about our new dwelling place, about the kingdom of heaven. This is what the Father is laying down as the authority. That's why the attack is on fathers. Make no mistake. You know what happens when you talk about that? Then women get mad because they feel like they're being attacked and they don't understand that they're being helped. They're being delivered just like the church. When you look back at what the Father's doing, it sets you free. When you get mad about it, it's pride. When you're offended by it, it's you. It's not God. It's his design, not ours. But we want to live in our design and follow the age, the spirit of the age, and not the Father. But Jesus said, if you want to have life, obey the Father. Keep his commandments. It's not a mean thing to tell people truth. Don't go in there. There's a lion that's going to kill you. Ah, Maybe I can fight. There's a lion in there that's going to kill you. Yeah, I used to tame lions. I read a book on it once. I don't know where that came from. I'm just telling you. It's dangerous. Listen. Listen to what God is saying to us. See, I tell people this all the time, and we need to understand this, is that we've been born again in apostasy. What does that mean? Right? Well, the same way, the same way that, that the early church was born in the world and there was apostate lives all around, we've been born in the church and there's false synagogues of Satan all around and they're saying they're the church. But they're not guarding and keeping God's commandments. They're not guarding and keeping God's word. So they cannot be God's church. They've moved the plumb line. That's not God's church. That's a synagogue of Satan. And we all can fall into this danger if we don't stick with the word of God. So he's going to pray the Father, and the Father will give them another, alos, another, alos, A-L-L-O-S. Listen, some people will teach, oh, it, it, another means the self-same. No, no, see, he's in flesh right now. But he's led by the Spirit of God. And, and, and when he asks the Father, he's going to send back the Spirit of truth, a Spirit that has no flesh, has nothing to do with flesh, not as confined by flesh. But it's another in the sense of it's God. He's God in the flesh, led by the Spirit. He's going to send back another, the Spirit, God 100%, who's not confined by anything except by your choices. If it's just by your will, what do you want to do? Because you, you, you can go as far as you want to go with the Spirit of God, as long as He designed you to do it. As long as He called you to do it, He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things that God calls you to do. So if you ask anything, and it's in His name, according to His authority, according to His house, I guarantee you He'll do it. Now, He might say, Wait, He might say, It's not time yet. Or he might say, I didn't call you to build a house. Your son's going to build the house. But you can still prepare other people for it. You can still help and encourage others in it. He'll give you another helper. King James, comforter. Comforter.
You guys get that? 14.1, he was comforting them. And he's in the flesh with the spirit. And now he's going to give them another spirit, just, just, just the spirit with no flesh to comfort them. Because that's what it's about. He's comforting us. Things are, things are crazy. You're going to die me three times, Peter. And then he begins to comfort them. Let not your heart be troubled. Tells him about spiritual things, about the future. About he's going to go away and come back. And then he says, I'm going to give you another comforter, a helper. Because that's what he's doing is helping them. How's he helping them? By presenting the message that the Father told him to present. By saying nothing except what the Father told him to say. How do we help a dead and dying world? By telling them the word of God that Jesus delivered to us. If you make up some other stuff, it's not going to help them. It's going to hurt them. It's going to hinder them. It's going to be gasoline on their fire. But see, that's what the devil's doing. He's making up all these other words, all these other isms, all these other things, and saying, here's your help, turn in here. And it's all a lie. He's pouring gasoline on their fire. He's making their fire bigger. And then he'll say, well, it's just burning because you didn't do this. Now you've got to do this. It's just burning higher because you need to do this. Oh, well, maybe if I do this. How about if you just follow his commandments? How about if you just surrender to his spirit? How about if you just believe that he knows what's going on in your heart already and knows exactly what you need and you need to come to him for wisdom and help in time of need? How about just trusting him? How about just believing him? And if you do, it's a change of mind. You stop listening to a lying world that's trying to deceive you. And you put all your eggs in one basket and you trust the word of God and the spirit of God, no matter how it feels, no matter what it looks like, you trust God. And he says, I will beseech, entreat the father. He just told them to pray and he tell them he's praying. He'll send you another comforter. The word is parakletos. Listen, it's parakletos. Some people, my brother likes to say paracletes. That way he remembers it. You know, paracletes help you run better, help you walk better. It's a good way to remember it. You need the Holy Spirit to walk in the spiritual realm, to run the race to win. You need a paracletes. It helps you to do that. The right equipment will get you into the right place. So now you need this other helper, this spirit of God to seal you. He's a paracletes that teaches you to walk, teaches you to run. He is the one that's going to guide you and lead you and direct you and seal you so that you know now that you're the father. You're going to be able to see and hear and know God when nobody else is seeing it. Nobody else is hearing it. Nobody else understands and you're still going to know because of the spiritual realm. Because he's a spiritual teacher. Because we live in a spiritual kingdom. But you have to talk to him. You have to cry out to him. You have to ask him. You have to turn your heart towards home and believe him. Paracletus. Para is one who comes alongside. Para is one who comes alongside. What's he coming alongside to do? He's going to be my advocate. He's going to console me. He's going to comfort me. He's going to help me. He's going to be my teacher. It, it's um, the one I always use because of my life is paralegal. See, a paralegal is a legal advocate that can do everything. He comes alongside, they come alongside of a lawyer, and they can do everything except practice law in the courtroom. See, you're called to be the witness. You're called to be the jury. You're the one called to practice in the, in the courtroom. Not the paralegal. The paralegal is not licensed, cannot do those decisions for you. So the Holy Spirit is there with all the power, all the truth, all the guide, all the wisdom, everything. But it has to be if. It has to be your decision, your choice. And when you choose to obey, the power is there. When you choose to follow, the guide is there. When you choose to do it, you're there in the courtroom being the witness. But if you don't choose to, the Holy Spirit cannot do it for you or force it on you. He's just the power and the ability and the might. 
He's the dynamite. The word is dynamo. Dynamite. The power. That's where we get the word dynamite. But you have to make the choice to open your mouth and use your speech that is um, seasoned with salt. You have to choose to ask, how do I answer each one? It's up to you. Your choice. God is a gentleman. He's never going to force it. But he does love to train his children in the way that they're supposed to go. He loves to conform them into his image. He loves to wash and cleanse us. He loves to change our desire. And he will. He can. He does. If we choose to turn our hearts toward home. Or we can choose to keep listening to the spirit of this world. The Antichrist spirit. And then what? And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, a comforter, a paracletus, one who comes alongside to do everything for you. He knows everything about law. He knows everything about my word. He knows everything about me. He knows the heart of God because he is God. Why? That he may abide with you forever. Well, what are we talking about? We're talking about dwelling places. And then we're talking about now the Spirit of God abiding and dwelling in us forever. This is the I and you and you and me. He's going to get to it in John 15. Um, abide, of course, is mino. And it means to stay in a given place, state, or relationship, an expectancy. He's going to stay. He's going to abide with us forever. Isn't that amazing? With, yeah, uh -huh, forever. But that can change. Wait a minute, forever. It can change. Notice, the spirit of truth. Now he's telling you who he is, the spirit of truth. Well, who's truth? He just told you, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So it's his spirit. Again, it's God. Hard to understand, easy to comprehend if you just want to believe it. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. Whom the world, the cosmos, this orderly uh, creation that you see, that's in chaos now, cannot receive. He's going to give us the spirit, but they cannot receive it because, one, they're not worthy. One, they, they don't believe. One, they aren't turning their mind toward home. They're not looking to follow the commandments. They're not looking to eat the pill, the authoritative prescription of what God has given them, which is the provision for the sin nature, which is Jesus the Christ, which there is salvation in no other name. They're looking to keep chasing sin and self and Satan and think they're okay. So they can't receive the Spirit. Only those that believe and metanoia turn, because if you believe, you have to repent. You have to change your mind. Because you were believing you were okay, now you change your mind and you go, I need help. I'm troubled. I'm agitated. And I believe this hope that Jesus is giving me. So he's going to stay in a given place and abide and continue remain and dwell with us forever. Now listen, because that's that word with again. He said he will be with you. See, there's, there's two different words. One is with is para, paralegal. One who comes alongside to help. This word here is meta. Among among us. Listen, the Holy Spirit is here convicting of sin and righteousness and judgment. And, and, and he's with us in the world. But we're getting ready to get some great information, uh, truth from God about what else he can do. The spirit of truth. God himself. God, very God. Who's in the world. Let me read this again. 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Did I run out of time yet? No, I got another hour. Wow. Watch. 
Why'd you have to say that? Oh, Emma. The world cannot. That's the absolute negative. We've been looking at that word a bunch. Cannot is an absolute negative. It means unworthy. It means without. See, they're outside. Without. The world cannot receive any spiritual truth. They're trapped under delusion. You say, well, why are they believing that? Why are they following that? Because their eyes are not open. They don't have the spirit of God. They don't have the truth of God. We used to be like that, and God woke us up by the grace of God. It's not something you figured out. He woke us up because he loves us. And because he loves us, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You listening? You got this? It's... So now, if we love him, we're going to go to other people that are still asleep and tell them. And then if the Spirit of God is actually working on them, they will wake up just like we did. They cannot, it's an absolute negative, receive. And, and this is two words for receive here. It's dynama libano. Dynama is where the power comes from. Dynama is power. It's possible through God's power. And Lebano is to get a hold of. They have no power to get a hold of it because the Spirit of God is not letting them wake up until it's their time. So they have no power to see, which means to discern or acknowledge or consider. And then, of course, but we know um, they don't see him or know him, which is gnoskos. Because the gnoskos, again, is the word for um, intimacy, learning to know, coming to know. And I, I guess somebody told me I made a mistake last week, and I said it was uh, sexual intercourse in the spiritual realm. And, and that was a mistake, and if you caught it on the tape, it's supposed to be social intercourse in the spiritual realm. Because it's a social listening to God and hearing the voice. And when you hear truth, you bear fruit from truth. Sexual is in the physical where you have you listen to a voice and you bear fruit from who you're having intimacy with. And if you're listening to the voice of the Antichrist, you're still bearing fruit of death. But if you're listening to the voice of God, you begin in the spiritual realm to bear fruit of life. And as you bear that fruit, you tell others about it. You become a, a, a living oak of righteousness in front of them, and they learn what truth looks like by how you act. But the word, it, it means intercourse, and that, which means a conversation. Intercourse used to mean a conversation. Now we change it into just physical sexual terms, but really intercourse means social conversations where we're entering into agreement together in intimacy to talk about things, to eat over a meal, and that's what they would do in this culture, and that would bear fruit because we come to know each other. We learn about each other, and if God is perfect and we're coming to know him and we're changing our mind, we become more like him and bear fruits worthy of repentance. It shows. It becomes a tree when you're planted by the rivers of living water. I better move this quickly. We're out of time because brains have shut off. So the world doesn't see him, doesn't know him, but he dwells, but you know him, you gnosko him. Listen, because if you've turned your heart and you're believing, you gnosko him, you're longing for intimacy with him. You heard his voice, and now you want to hear it more. You had a conversation, and he told you Jesus is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead, and you believed it. So now you want to bear more fruit. So he has to, we're going to get to it in John 15, he has to cut away some of them sucker branches in your life so that more fruit can grow. For he dwells, he's abiding with you, para, and will be in you. Greek preposition en. Now this really opens up a door uh, to what I like to call the threefold ministry of the Holy Spirit. Listen, everything about your life today in the church is with the power of God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will birth you into the kingdom of God, baptize you into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to pray and when to pray, how to pray, but you have to surrender to him. 
The Holy Spirit is God himself. They, we call it the third person of the Trinity, but really when you go first, second, and third, there's no difference because they're all three God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They just have a different uh, um, uh, um, job description, you might say, but they're all three 100% God. The Father has a plan. The Father's plan sends the Son. The Son asks the Father to send back the Spirit. But all three of them are working together in tandem. Even right now, the Father's plan. The Son is dying. The Spirit is going to seal you and teach you and be with you, which is alongside para. The Holy Spirit is alongside you. He can't make the decision for you, but he can counsel you in what decision to make in the courtroom. Right? Well, how is he doing that? Well, I invited him into my heart. I believed in Jesus, so he came in, the Greek preposition E-N. And now he's in my heart, not in one room, but my whole heart. But I still have a choice. Do I want to give him my whole heart? Or do I just want to keep him confined only to Sunday morning? And just keep him in that one little bitty spot where he can counsel me then, but I'm going to go away and counsel myself for the rest of the week. See, he wants your whole heart. In is the Greek preposition E-N. He seals you until the day of redemption. And then he's in your heart to do full home makeover, to teach you to be faithful, to teach you to bear fruit, to teach you to listen and watch and follow and how to study and grow, to teach you where to go, to teach you what to say. But over in Acts 1.8, listen, in Acts 1.8, when the, these boys, after Jesus raises from the dead, they go, will you at this time restore the kingdom? They're looking at the physical still. They're looking at physical power, physical kingdom, physical ruling in Jerusalem. And, and he says, that's not for you to know the things that the Father has put under his own power. But you, Acts 1.8, but you, this is for you. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be witnesses for me throughout Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's why I'm telling you it's the threefold ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's with you, alongside, counseling you. You believe him, so he comes into your heart. Now he's speaking to you from inside your heart, and you have a choice to say, no, I don't want gifts, I don't want talents, I don't want abilities, I don't want to be washed and cleansed, I'm listening to the world. But then he also comes up on you. It's the Greek word epi, upon. It's also translated with. It's actually when he comes upon Mary in Luke 1, then she is found with child. So all at the same time, he comes up on her, the Holy Spirit, and then he plants his seed in her, and she has a child in her, E-N, and then that child grows up and obeys God the Father. And that's what you and I are supposed to understand, that the Holy Spirit, he first convicts us of sin and righteousness and judgment, and then we believe him and he comes in us after he's been alongside us, protecting us. Well, why would he be alongside you, protecting you, comforting you? Because God knew what answer you was going to give. By his foreknowledge, he always knew that you and I were going to choose him, because he never learns anything. But then you have to choose whether you want to obey him still and keep his commandments. And if you do, then he gives you gifts. He gives you talents. He gives you abilities. There's a lot more inheritance available to help you walk and be a witness. The Greek word martyr, it's where we get the Greek word, it's martyreo. It's one who dies for his faith. When you're dying for your faith, the Holy Spirit can actually live in your life and be up on you with power, be up on you. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon kings or come upon prophets or come upon uh, 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 the priest just for specific purposes, right? The New Testament, he comes with us, in us, and upon us, sometimes all at the same time for the work of the ministry, for the glory of God. But make no mistake, it's not so you can be a, a glorified rock star. It's not so you can be a glorified rock star preacher. It's so that you can be a witness to the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you can walk in love and love others as Christ loved them. Wash their feet. Take care of them. 
It's, it's so you can keep his commandments. You can understand his law. That's what the power of God is for. It's not so you can go on living in this cesspool of the grave and walking down here and trying to raise up for yourself. That's not life at all. Anything down here that you're trying to gain is not life at all unless it's a soul. That's what the Holy Spirit is here doing today. What's the Holy Spirit do? I'm glad you asked. The Holy Spirit always points back to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is always pointing back to the Father's plan and the Father's word. So it's always going to go back to the throne room because all of our marching orders come from heaven. Notice Jesus is praying. He's our high priest. He lives to make intercession, we're told in Hebrews chapter 7. That's what he's doing right now. He's praying for every single one of us right now. He's praying that my mouth will open and speak his word, and he's praying that your heart will open and receive with meekness the implanted word for the saving of the soul. He's praying right now that we would go out and tell others truth, that we would be the body of Christ, that we would allow his power to rule and reign in our lives, and that we would not be afraid because we don't have to be troubled. We believe in God, believe also in Him. In His Father's house are many mansions, and many dwelling places. And if it were not true, He would have told us. And where He goes, He goes to prepare a place for us. That where He is, we might be also. But it's our choice. It's our choice. He's not going to force this on anybody. But what happens is, is we walk out of the church, we walk away from our Bibles, we walk away and we go back doing what we've always been doing. We don't go start applying the authoritative prescription of the Word of God and telling other people about it. We just go back, well, I did my little pious duty, and now I'm going to go back to my life. Your life is hidden. It's buried with Christ. When He appears, you will appear. It's the Holy Spirit living through us now. And there's power available, but you have to have a relationship with God. Gnoskos continue to grow in intimacy to bear fruit of righteousness. It looks like love. Why does it look like love? Because he told us to love others as he loved us. And we have no capacity to love. If we, we have no capacity to love him. We have no capacity to guard and keep his commandments. Because we are flesh. But with the spirit married to our spirit, and we start to obey the husbandman, we can actually do all these things as we surrender because the power is available. The truth is available. The kingdom is available. It's there whether you believe it or not. But when you believe it, you change your mind and you begin to walk in it. And you trust him and then you see the fruit hanging on the tree. Good stuff. Good stuff. Why is it so good? Because he says in 18, I will not leave you fatherless. You see it as orphans. It's translated fatherless in James. Pure and undefiled religion is this, to visit widows and fatherless. Listen, we're the fatherless. Oh, you, oh, no, oh, the devil's my father. What? Fatherless. Don't you want to be in a family? Don't you want to be in the family of God? Don't you want to be brought back into his house? See, the devil's a father. He's the father of all lies, but he ain't a real father. He's a fake father. He's the father of all lies, and if you're going to worship him and, and live with him and not, not obey God, that's who your father is, but he's not a real father. He's a fake father. He has no ability to be a father. He doesn't know how to be a father. A father nourishes and takes care of and protects and plans and leads and guards. The father has sent a son to save us, and the son laid down his life for us. And the Spirit also is waiting to empower us to live for Him and to tell others about it. That's provision of a home. Why is the home so destroyed in America? Because the devil hates family. He abandoned his family. He abandoned his place. He left his proper abode where the Spirit is going to dwell with us. We're going to dwell with the Father. He left it. He chose to rebel. We have a choice to make. God allows us free will. 
Look, I will not leave you fatherless. I will come to you. He just promised the Spirit. Then he says, I will come to you. And he's saying, I am the same. It's another, but now there's not no flesh. Right now I'm confined in flesh, going from city to city, talking with you, being led by that Spirit. But when I die and rise again, I'm going to ascend into heaven, and then I'm going to send that Spirit that's not confined in flesh. And it can dwell in each one of you. And each one of you can become a part of the body. Each one of you can do your part. And it can be a perfect representation of who I am by your love for one another. Can you wash feet? Will you surrender? I will not leave you uh, orphans, actually, in the King James is actually um, translated comfortless. But it's the word orphonos, where we get orphans from. And it means bereaved, though, or bereft of a father. It means without a father, so fatherless. Because think about it. The teachers in those days were leading them. It was almost like they were the head of the house. They were the head of everything. And they believed. They hung on every word. They would obey perfectly. They, and John the Baptist says, I'm not even worthy to unlash his shoe. I'm not even worthy to wash his feet. Yet that God came and washed our feet. And, and, and John knew that he wasn't even worthy to unloosen his shoe to get close to washing his feet. That's, a, that's, that's what we need to be. That we would decrease it so that he could increase but we think, oh, yeah, I know why God called me. He's going to make me this. He's going to make me that. And I'm going to rule this and rule that. That's a bad place to be, people. Yeah, I know he can use my degree and he can use my this. No, he doesn't want none of that. He wants you to die. He wants you to surrender. That's all our own esteem. I will. Follow his eyes. I will not leave you fatherless. He's a great provider. I will come to you. I will appear to you. Uh, pretty amazing. He is the Spirit. I better finish this. Man, I thought I was finished too. Nineteen. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. In other words, they're going to lead him to the cross. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. See, he's talking about resurrection there. When he gets up, now we can, we can believe that he is the Messiah. We can get up. We don't have to stay dead. At that day, you will know, you will gnoskos that I am, in the italics, that I am my father. I am in my father and you in me and I in you. Notice all three become one because of the Spirit of God sealing us until the day of redemption. He who has, now he's going to repeat what he said in the beginning, so I don't have to really teach this again. But he's couched all of this in the Spirit coming in between, keep my commandments. Look at it, it's a cookie. It's a sandwich. It's bread. 15 and now 21. He who has my commandments... Because now we know and guards them it is he who loves me agapeo once again and he who loves me there's a reward will be loved by my father because that's who he came from and I will love him and appear or manifest myself show myself to him I will show myself to him once again it's the authoritative commandments but listen listen now there's a word added there's a word added. See the word has? King James is hath, H-A-T-H. Guess what it is in the Greek? It's the word echo. So it's for the word possession. Remember when the, we just read in Acts, I don't know what it was, 16 or something? The demonic woman possessed by a demon? The word is echo. That's what was ruling her. And she's going, these are the servants of the Most High God. These are the servants. And, and what happens? She's echoing the demon realm, but she's not glorifying God. She's got a voice, but it's coming from the demonic realm, even though she's pointing to Paul. 
But echo is the word for possession. Now, he's saying, since you have the Holy Spirit, you're possessed by the Spirit of God. You're possessed by the Word of God. You have it. You have it. Now you need to guard it. Now you need to keep it. Same thing again. But it's couched in between two. And then he will exhibit in person himself. He'll make himself known. When you have the Spirit of God, the book, the Bible comes alive. When you have the Spirit of God, he makes himself known in the reading of the Word. He's speaking with you. He's having a conversation with you. You're growing in the grace and the knowledge. You'll grow in intimacy as you read the Word of God. He'll be planting his seed in you, and things will be growing. You'll be like, what is going on? How can this be? How can this be in the Word of God? And he reveals it to you as he wants to. When he wants to, he teaches you. But you have to draw near to God. Every bit of it is about drawing near to God. And then making the right decision once you draw near. Rich young ruler, what did he do? He drew near, but then when he heard truth, he walked away because his heart was wrapped up in his stuff. When you draw near to God and you hear truth, you keep drawing near. You get closer and closer. You don't go away. You might have to say, Lord, how can I do that? But you don't go away because he has the words of eternal life. He is eternal life. And we need to guard that. We need to guard that by his power, his strength, for his glory, for such a time as this. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit that reveals your word. Thank you that, Lord, we're asking now that you would reveal yourself to us and we would not be afraid. We would not be troubled. We do believe in God, and we believe you are the Messiah. You are the living word of God, and we believe that you will teach us how to obey. You will teach us how to guard your authoritative prescription and apply it to our life. You'll teach us when to speak and when not to speak and how to speak, and then you will fill us with your Holy Spirit for your glory so that we can be witnesses for you in this grand courtroom. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for calling us to give testimony today. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you.